I've got something I'm excited to share with you. I think it'll bring hope to you, especially if you have children between the age of, say, middle school, well, really any age, but specifically this message is going to come into play when you talk about young people from middle school age all the way up to adulthood into their 30s and 40s, your children as they grow up. Uh, if you've had children or if you're believing God for the health, the spiritual health of one of your children. I want to open with prayer. Father, we just come before you today and we ask you to speak a word to us. Though we are going to talk today, Jesus, about our children, this, this principle that we're going to talk about crosses all boundaries and really relates to us even personally. So we come to you today and we ask you for your strength and your help as we approach your word today. Speak to us. May revival be going on in our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank Pastor Ryan and those of you that were with us last week. He did such a fabulous job on the word that he brought to us, and I want to thank him for doing that. What a great team member he is to have on our team here at Enjoy Church. Uh, we love him and his family, and we love you guys, and we love all of our team. We have some great key players with different gifts and different strengths, and what a blessing they are, and what a blessing you guys are, because you are Enjoy Church. So um, I just want to say thank you, Pastor Ryan. Great job. And thank you, Pastor Laura, for her word this past weekend. She did a fabulous job as well, talking about making room, making sure there's room in your heart. The scripture from Jesus in John chapter 8, room in your heart for God's word. Let's all make sure we have room in our heart for the Word of God. And if you didn't hear either of those, go back to our YouTube and watch that. Go to our website, enjoychurch.com, and watch those messages. They are fabulous. Today, I want to talk to you about you and your belief for your young people. Those of you that have children, especially as they grow into their teenage years, into their adult years, uh, some of them probably walked away from God or it seemed like maybe they were walking away from God for just a little while. I know I did that uh, in my teenage years. I had some ups and downs and peer pressure and trying to find out who I was and where I was going and those type of things. So I want to talk to you about a story that's in the Old Testament that I think you'll be able to relate to and I believe it'll be a blessing to you. This is the story of Abraham. Abraham and Sarah had received a promise from God that they would have a, a nation. Uh, you know the story. Abraham went out on the sand and he looked at the sand and God said, you'll have a nation that's more than the grains of the sand. And then he looked at the stars and he said, more than the stars in the sky, which by the way, there are more stars in the sky than there are uh, grains of sand. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? If you've ever been on a beach to think that there are more stars than the sand. Anyway, God promised Abraham that he would have that kind of a nation through his posterity, his children. And that, you know, that promise, like so many of us, it took a long time to come about. You ever had that? God puts a, puts a dream in your heart, puts a plan in your heart, and it seems like this is not going to happen. I don't know if I heard wrong. I don't know. Maybe I did something wrong uh, along the way. You begin to question yourself. You begin to question God. You've been there probably, haven't you? I know I've done that. God spoke to me some things and 10 years go by and it hasn't happened yet. You shared the dream with a few people. They begin to question you like, yeah, God told him, right, right. You know, we've all had that happen to us. Well, Sarah and Abraham had that happen and they became kind of impatient. Sarah said to Abraham, crazy thought, but she said it to him. She said, I have this handmaiden. She's, she works for me. I, I don't know. Maybe we, maybe we need to help God out. Abraham, go in, sleep with her, and maybe the, 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 maybe the promise will come through that. And Abraham goes, okay, he did it. And sure enough, she becomes pregnant and they give birth to a son named Ishmael. Now Ishmael grew and he became, uh, he was circumcised. The scripture tells us he was circumcised at 13 years old. I want you to pay attention to the timeline because this is kind of important. If you're believing God for your adult children, or if you're believing God that that looks like you've raised them the right way, but it seems like they've walked away. It seems like they're not going to church anymore. It seems like maybe they've started, you know, experimenting with drugs or alcohol and 
uh, promiscuity, sexually, a few different things like that. And here they are, adult children. They were raised in church, right? Well, let me give you this timeline. So Ishmael's 13 years old when he was circumcised. When he was 14 years old, Scripture tells us in Genesis that uh, Genesis chapter 21, you can read the, the timeline and the account of all of this. But when he was 14 years old, Sarah becomes pregnant. Abraham was 100 years old. 100, that's right, you heard it right. He was 100, it was a miracle. And Sarah, when God spoke and said, you'll become pregnant, she laughed and the Lord said, what'd you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh, but she did laugh. And anyway, long story short, she becomes pregnant. They give birth to the promise and the promise was Isaac. That was what God had promised. Now they took matters into their own hand. They had this, this 14 year old son who when the promise was born, God loved Isaac. God loved Ishmael, even though he was born out of their plan and their getting involved, God still loved that young man. And the scripture talks about that. So he's at 14. The scripture says in Genesis 21, verse 5, that Sarah overheard Ishmael mocking and making fun of his younger half-brother Isaac. And this took place when he was 17, theologians say between 17 and 19. And we could go into that, but the point's not to, not to, 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 to prove how old he was, but he was. He was between 17 and 19. Now, the reason this is important, because most of you that have been in church, most of you that have grown up in church have heard this story where Sarah comes to her husband, Abraham, and he says, she says, oh no, we are, we are not going to have this going on in this house. Because that wasn't her son. Oh, it was Abraham's son. But she goes, honey, you are going to have to put this woman, Hagar, and the son, and you need to put them out of the house. And what's funny to me is the scripture, if you read it, and I encourage you to read it later, Go back and read Genesis chapter 21. The scripture says, Abraham listened to his wife. In fact, the scripture actually says this, that the Lord told him, you better listen to your wife. How many of you want to hear that, that word of God to you? Husbands, you better listen to your wife. Anyway, that's what God told Abraham. And so scripture says he did listen to his wife and he sent them out. And Hagar and Ishmael, he was somewhere between 17 and 19 years old. Think about this. You've got an adult son or daughter. They're sent out into the desert. For those of you that have adult children or late teenage years, and you feel like that your kids are in a desert place, they're not living for God, they're not close for God, I, think, I really want you to, to tune in with your ears. I really want you to listen to this because I've preached about this in a long, 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 long time. I want to put hope on the inside of you for your children. Some of you may have even, maybe you've even given up on believing that they'll ever, or you've questioned yourself, what have I done wrong? How have I raised? I thought I raised them in church. I thought I taught them the principles of God. I thought I prayed over them. I thought I believed God, and I see no signs of that in their life. Well, I'm going to give you hope today, and I want you to believe God that great things are going to happen. So he sends them out of the house. The scripture picks up, and I'll read this verse to you because it's pretty cool. It says here that in verse 15, well, let me just back up and read from verse 11. It says, and the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight on account of Ishmael, who had been making fun of his son. And God said, uh, don't let it seem so grievous or evil to you because of the youth and the bondwoman. He said, in all that Sarah says to do, do what she asks you to do. For Isaac shall be the posterity, and he shall be called. And the nation will be made from the son of... Uh, I will also make a nation out of the bondwoman, that's Hagar, out of her uh, offspring as well. So verse 14, Abraham, now that's another promise. Okay, watch this because that's another promise. God will take care of... He'll take care of you if you trust him. Keep trusting him and then do the next thing. Trust God 
do the next thing. Trust God, do the next thing. Watch this. Abraham rose early in the morning and took, a bre took bread and a bottle of water, and he gave it to Hagar, and he put it on her shoulder, and he sent her and the youth away. Must have ripped his heart out because that was, he had become one with this woman. I mean, they had a child together. She wondered, watch what the word says. She wondered aimlessly, and she got lost in the desert. It says she lost her way in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, if you study that region at all, you will realize that is a very dangerous place to get lost in the desert. You can die really quick right there. Verse 15 says this, When the water bottle was all gone, Hagar caused the youth, the young man who was between 17 and 19 years old, to lay under a shrub. He was becoming dehydrated, and he was crying out. And we know this because what the Scripture says. It says in verse 16, She went and she sat down an opposite good way off from him, about a bow shot away, a bow and arrow. How far you can shoot it is about how far she went. It says, let me not see his death. And she went opposite of him. And he lifted up his voice and he wept and he called out as he did. Now, I'll come back to that in just a second. But I want you to know that the reason that he called out is because he was crying. He was desperate. Now, think about him. He had been raised, even though he was not the promise for the, the, the covenant that God made, he was still Abraham's child. He had been raised in a godly environment with a man of faith who believed God. Even though this whole situation had happened through a mistake, he had still been raised to believe God, to trust God, to hear God's voice, to know there's a God that created him and uh, gave him life. He's in under this shrub bush out in the desert. As you could imagine, he's dying. He doesn't have water. He doesn't have enough provision to sustain life. He's weeping out. He's on the brink of death. Now, I want to relate this to you before we go on. Someone, whoa, someone watching me right now. You have a child. You have a child that's in a situation like this that you are just on the brink of going, Lord, I guess I'm going to have to step away. I'm going to have to let go of this child because they're not serving the Lord. They're not coming back. I thought they'd come back. They're in a desperate place. If you've got a child that's in a desperate place, maybe they're rebellious. Maybe they're addicted. Maybe they've become an alcoholic. Maybe, maybe they're rebellious and living in sin. Maybe they've walked totally away. And um, it's breaking your heart. And you can't bear to see it. Mm. Painful. I relate to you, but I've got such hope for you. I'm emotional because I know where you're at. I've been through that with my children. Almost all of them have gone through the same type of phase at some point in their life where they've been through stuff. Some still go through stuff. And I want to give you hope. And I want to encourage you. And those of you that are on the early side, if that you have young people that are maybe, you know, young children, seven years old, five years old, seven years old, even younger than that, all the way up through the middle school age, I want to encourage you, keep praying for them. Keep, the biggest thing, honestly, one of the biggest and one of the best things you can do for your children if you do want them to come back is raise them in a culture. Don't attend church once a month. Don't attend church once every, you know, uh, Easter or, or every Christmas. Get their little rear ends in church every week. And get them in the children's ministry that we'll be starting up again soon here uh, shortly. Get them in there. Let us partner with you as Enjoy Church. Let us through our children's ministry and our children's workers. And maybe one of, some of you want to step up and get involved in the children's ministry. Get involved because here's what we do. We don't realize we're doing it. But life is made up of little steps. See, the things that you want to come back when that child is 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 34, 40 years old, when you want them to come back, 
You need to make sure that all the little things you did, you did your best. Now, I know we won't be perfect because we're, we're human beings too. And we've made some big mistakes. I mean, you know, oh man, pastor, I feel such condemnation. I didn't bring my kids to church. I, I just brought them occasionally. Some of you, when they were nine or 10 years old and they said they didn't want to go to church, you go, well, it's okay, sweetheart. Uh, okay, I want my kids to want to come to church, so I'll let it be their decision. Let me just stop. I'm not calling you stupid, okay? But that's stupid. That, that action is so stupid to do that. Make your 12-year-old, make your 15, 16, 17-year-old that lives under your roof, oh, you're, one thing you will do under this roof is you will come to church. Okay, that's a good policy. This is just a policy. Come to church. Why? Because they're going to be exposed to faith. They're going to be exposed to worship. They're going to be exposed to the Word of God. They're going to be exposed at all ages to the culture of a relationship with God and exposed to a culture of faith. That's why church attendance is so important. But then, not just church only, when you're at home, when you're driving down the road, you need to speak covenant to them. You need to speak faith to them at bedtime. When you're putting them to bed, pray a blessing. Teach them what spiritual warfare is. We bind every evil spirit, every demonic force. We bind them from this house. We apply and declare the blood of Jesus over this house. Do that with them as they grow up at bedtime. And teach them what it means to stand in faith. You know, declare the word. Get a scripture or two or three or four or ten and just declare them. I remember one of my first scriptures my dad made us do is... is uh, in Proverbs, it says, My son, when sinners entice thee, consent thou not. That's a King James Version. But what it means is this. My dad made us repeat it every night for years. My son, when sinners try to entice you to come in, don't give them consent. So my dad drilled that in. And there were times, honestly, when I was growing up, sinners tried to entice me, and I gave them consent. But here's what did happen. I knew there was something crying out. Even when I was living in moments or actions of sin, because my parents had raised me in that culture and in that environment, there was something in me that was calling out, something in me that was just crying out, this is wrong. This is not your place, Darren. This is not where you belong. And I could, I had such conflict in my soul because I was, Convicted. Conviction is such a good thing. And I know conviction is politically incorrect. Nobody wants to be convicted because it causes it's a tension between where you are and where God wants you to be. It's the blessed place, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But conviction is so sweet. When you teach your children the covenant that God has for them and you teach them practically the Word of God by example, how to do spiritual warfare how to stand in faith for healing, how to stand in faith for another person, how to stand in faith for a new job or stand in faith for a difficulty you're facing. Hey, those little eyes, those little eyes and those older eyes, let me just tell you, they are watching you. See, your faith walk is more than just for you. It's for those around you because we watch each other. We, uh, we learn from one another. We learn by example. It encourages me when I see people who don't quit, people who could quit, they're in a difficult situation, and they don't. I get encouraged. I want to be like them, like you guys. I've watched so many of you guys go through difficult situations, and you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. You keep getting up when you get knocked down, and you keep believing God. Guess what? Your pastor gets encouraged by watching you, and I hope you see the same thing in us. So many times we could pull over and park. Uh-uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to live our life of faith because there are a lot of people who are watching us and your children, just let me say it again, your children are watching you. And when they're in a difficult place, there's something in them that cries out. Here Ishmael is under this bush. He's 17 to 19 years old. He's crying in pain because he hadn't had any water. And it's a difficult situation. So much so that as a parent, Hagar could not stand to even be close. She had to get away. 
a bow shot away. That's pretty far. A bow, a bow and arrow will shoot pretty far. And that's how far away she went because she couldn't stand to hear the weeping. The scripture said, we just read it, that she could not stand to watch her son die. And some of you are in that place right now thinking that your child spiritually has just walked away or that your child has made so many bad mistakes that you can't stand to bear it anymore. And here's where I want to pick this up. This is the promise that God has for me, for you, for us together, for our children, for each other as well. Verse 17, it said, God heard. Now, I would have thought that it would say God heard the voice of Hagar, <laughs> but it didn't. Nope. Here's what it said. It said, God heard the voice of the youth, the young person. See, this is why it's so important for you to never quit bringing your kid to church when they're young all the way up until they're old enough to make their own decisions, which is, you know, over 18, I would say. And it says, God heard the voice of the youth, that thing that's in your child that you've put into them and that they've been exposed to in children's ministry and youth ministry. By the way, Pastor Ryan's going to be doing some awesome and some incredible things with our youth as well. It says, the angel of God called to Hagar. God's going to call to you. And here's what he's going to say. Called out of heaven and said to her, what troubles you? What a question. Uh, you know, sometimes you want to question God and go, God, I mean, really? <laughs> really? Did you just ask me what's troubling me? My kid has freaked out. My kid's addicted. My kid's rebellious. My kid. But haven't you raised them in a godly environment? Well, here's the promise. You are a person of covenant. Watch this. What troubles you, Hagar? Question mark. And here's God's statement. I want to speak this to you. I hope you hear the Holy Spirit speaking this to you. Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the youth. They know where he is. Arise, Hagar. Arise. Get up. It says this. Support him with your hand. For I intend to make you a great nation. There's that promise. Then God, this is the important part right now, right here, this verse, verse 19. Then God opened her eyes. I don't know if it was her physical eyes, but it may have been her spiritual eyes for sure. I'm saying to you like the book of Ephesians, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Help us see beyond the addiction. See beyond the rebellion. Help us see beyond the circumstances. Help us see beyond it. God appeared, opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. See, I want to say to you, provision is coming your way for you and your children and your family. But the eyes have to be open. No, I don't want my eyes open because, you know, then I'll know. I just want the provision. No, no, no. It comes together. This is why Pastor Laura's message Sunday was so important because today in these last days, so many people are turning away from truth. They want to believe what they want to believe and they want to believe it and they're going to believe it and I'm going to stick to my belief. This is what I've known. This is what I've thought. But grown-up stuff, spiritual grown-up stuff, is when we allow the Lord to open the eyes of our heart and maybe in that moment, for just a moment, maybe we'll go, oh, mm, I was wrong. It's called, it's called repentance, admitting maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't get it all. Maybe I don't know everything I thought that I knew. Being open, how do you open up? Two things you don't know, by allowing God to open the eyes of your heart. I'm pointing down here because the eyes of your heart are not in your head. The eyes of your heart are down here in your belly. In fact, most of the time the scripture refers to it, it's in your, he, he refers to it as your bowels. Open the eyes of my heart. Where does the Holy Spirit live? If you ask most people where the Holy Spirit lives, you get two answers. One the head, the other one the heart. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the Holy Spirit lives in your belly, 
Out of your belly flows the rivers. See, where do you feel stuff? I mean, if we were to stop, and we'll do this in another message sometime, but where do you feel? If you really stop and you think about it, where do you and I feel the Holy Spirit? I'll tell you where it's at. It's right down here in our belly. Have you ever been grieving over a situation or you've been interceding for another? Have you been praying for another? And a lot of times in those deep, intense moments of prayer and maybe even grieving, people put their hands on their belly. Oh, oh, Lord, I lift this situation up. They bend over, they get down in their belly. It's in those moments that you really connect with God. It's an incredible thing. And I want you to know, when she was grieving over the loss of her child, God opened her eyes and she saw provision. And listen to this. The promise came alive in that moment. He said, I'm going to make a great nation out of him. And then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and she filled the empty bottle with water and she caused the youth to drink it. And God was with the youth, and he developed, and he dwelt in the wilderness, and he became an archer so that he could hunt. Let me just say this to you. Most of you have heard this story before, and in your mind, you may be like me when I've heard it for years, you pictured her holding a little baby, and him, her putting that baby under a bush and walking away, my little baby's dying. No, no, this is a 19-year-old kid. It's still her baby, though. Think about it. Your 40-year-old child is still your baby. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm doing with this message. I want to encourage you, and I want to put faith in you. Your adult children, your teenage children, your middle school-age children, your little infants. Keep your faith for them. Keep the faith. And the best way you can help your children, here we go. The best way all of us can help our children, no matter what age they are, is to keep giving them water, the water of the Word of God. But you can't give them the water if you're blinded. You and I have to have our eyes open. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. In fact, I want to invite you to do this with me right now. And then we'll wrap up with prayer. But I want to invite you to put your hands on your belly for just a second. Put your hands on your belly. You might be thinking, you're not seeing me, Pastor. No, I am seeing you. By faith, I'm seeing you in the Spirit. I know some of you are just staring at me. Put your hands on your belly. See, don't be rebellious. Put your hands on your belly right now. Put them on your belly and say this with me. God, open the eyes of my heart. Out of my belly will flow rivers. There's that water of living water, the Word of God. Lord, open, open, open the eyes of our hearts so that we might truly see the provision for the life and know the promise that you have for not only us, but also for our children. I hope this Word has been an encouragement to you. If you've got a child or a family member, maybe a wife, maybe a husband, maybe a child, that's kind of drifted away from God, believe. And, and I love it. God is asking you, hey, why are you so downcast? Don't be afraid. How many times in the scripture does the scripture tell us, don't be afraid, don't fear, don't have that fear, come on. It's time for us to open the eyes of our heart. We'll be able to see in faith then. Keep quoting the word over your children. Keep praying for them. One of the things we did with our kids, and it's funny because it's come back uh, every time we would drive past a cemetery, we would say, you will live a long life. Confess the word with me. I will live and not die. And we would all go, I will live and not die. I will live and not die. Every time we would go past a cemetery, I will live and not die. I will live and not die. I am going to live. I am going to live a long, fruitful, prosperous life. We did that with our kids when they were two, three, four, five, six, seven years old, all the way up to teenage years. And now, as adults, when we're driving past, they're doing it to us. I will live a long life. 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 Anyway, make, make your Christian faith experience fun. Quote the words. Sing the songs. Put on a CD. 
you know, uh, read a scripture. You don't have to read a whole chapter even. Just read some scriptures. Proverbs is good. We love Proverbs because it's the book of wisdom. Ephesians is a good book because it talks about your identity in Christ. Your children need to know who they are. One of the best things you can do for your kids is give them wisdom and help them know who they are. Those two books, Ephesians, Proverbs, help them understand who they are in Christ, gives them the wisdom of God. Someday, someday when they're in a tough situation, when they're in a desert situation, God will hear their spirit crying out to him because of the culture that you raised them in. Hey, enjoy church. Keep up the good work. Get involved with us. Help us in our children's ministry. Help us serve at church. Um, church is kind of the foundation. Forsake not the assembly. I know it's fun to, especially you've created a habit of attending online, and I do too. But when the doors are open, and right now they're open on Sundays, the weekends, get your kids in the house and get them exposed to the Word of God. Get plugged in. It's only for an hour and a half of your life, a couple hours on the weekend. Get plugged in and, man, make it, make it a priority for your family. Watch what God does. And then, I know it's a little thing, and you might think, well, it's not making a difference. Oh, Jesus, it is making a difference. Because maybe it's 10 years down the road. Maybe it's 20 or 30 years down the road. Your kids are going to go through some stuff. Maybe in a marriage, a, a relationship issue, a health issue. And they're going to be under a bush crying out. And you're, you're going to be in pain for them. But you've got something to stand on. You have the promise of God's word. You are a person of covenant. And God's covenant with you is incredible. You're a person of covenant. Stand on his promise. Keep believing God with me, okay? All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We call on our covenant. This is not something that we know about from a distance. Our covenant is who our, our relationship is with you. You spoke the promise. We didn't make the promise. You did, Father. And based on your word and based on your promise, we make a demand on that promise. We have the authority to do it. We have the right to do it because you did it, not us. So, Lord, we tap. We tap into the promise right now with our faith. And we just drink from the well of living water, your word, the promises that you made. We stand in faith for our children. We bind every evil, satanic and demonic spirit of death, of stealing and destroying them. Satan, you will no longer have any of our children. We will stand in covenant. We will stand in faith and we will proclaim boldly your promises over our families at all ages from youth all the way up in Jesus name.